I could talk about a lot of things, but I'll try to keep uh, focus on a few, and then maybe you will have questions about some of the other ones. You might want to get closer to the microphone. Closer? Yeah. That's good. Um, I'd say First, I'll not, talk about some history. I'll talk about some history. Uh, yeah, good this far during the, the microphone. During, talk uh, into the microphone. Or, or hold, hold, it, hold it, it up. It's loose. Just take it up. There you go. Uh, Better. I'll go, I'll go over basically Venezuela history under Maduro. Because I figure you probably know something about Chavez. And I'll go over some of the gains of the Venezuelan revolution, why it's got such a reputation it has. And then I'll go into the U.S. sanctions and their effect on the Venezuelan economy. Um, but first, in the beginning, we should remember that uh, basically the whole Latin American progressive movement started when Chavez got elected in, in Venezuela back in 1998. Then it came Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, Bolivia, Ecuador, Honduras, um, <coughs> And Chile, even for a while, had progressive governments. Became a wave of progressive anti-neoliberal governments. I mean, some were more anti-neoliberal than others, but they were in defending their national so sovereignty. They took over the, these countries in Latin America. Uh, but it was led by Venezuela. And Venezuela became the main obstacle to U.S. hegemony in the, in the Americas, and it became, Chavez quickly became a target for U.S. overthrow. But the defeat of the Chavistas now in Venezuela would also lead to a reactionary wave sweeping all, throughout all Latin America, probably not only Latin America, but it affect the United States too, and probably other countries in the world. I read an article a little while ago that compared Venezuela as like the 1930s Spanish Republic of today, which I think it is. If Venezuela fell, basically the whole progressive movement in Latin America would start to collapse. Bolivia would be a serious threat of being overthrown, Evo Morales. I guess the peace process in, in Colombia would probably start to end if it's not already ending. Uh, it would, uh, the right-wing governments in Argentina and Brazil would have more power than they do now. And basically it would reassert U.S. control over Latin America if, if the Chavistas in uh, Venezuela uh, were overthrown. Um, basically the U.S. strategy now is to so ruin the Venezuelan economy that the people in Venezuela will vote out the Chavistas, which was basically their strategy they had with the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. To so ruin the Nicaraguan economy in the late 80s that people were just like, well, if we vote for the opposition, maybe these, uh, this terrible economic situation we're in will, will change. And so they voted out the the um, Sandinistas. That's basically what the U.S. is trying to do in Venezuela now, or has been for since uh, Chavez died in 2013. As you might remember, he became Chavez became famous probably when he was the first world leader to hold up those photos of children in Afghanistan who got bombed by the U.S., remember 2002, saying this is not how you fight terrorism, if you remember that, which immediately made him a target. And then their way, Venezuela later became famous because he was a he was overthrown in April 2002 and then the people restored him to power, which is kind of unique in the Latin American history. And the U.S., I mean, that government that the U.S. supported, that 48-hour government, they got rid of the whole Constitution and every single democratic form that existed in the country, and the U.S. celebrated it as a victory against dictatorship. Uh, Venezuela also uh, 
became an example for a new fight for social justice and for socialism and from independence from the U.S. that not only affected Latin America, but Africa, the Middle East, Palestine, you know, there was, um, Chavez became a, a famous figure all over the world. Venezuela became, a, the, the, under Chavez, it became a deeply anti-imperialist and anti-neoliberal revolution with the aims of becoming a new kind of socialist society. It never really established a socialist society, but he at least um, gave new credibility to socialism as a way forward after the collapse of the Soviet Union and socialism was discredited for a period of time. Now the U.S. has been trying to overthrow Venezuela for about 20 years. It's, it was bogged down with the wars in the Middle East, so it wasn't able to do it. And then after Chavez died, they thought they had a better opportunity with uh, Maduro taking over to try to crush the, the uh, Chavista Venezuela. But they found that it was not as easy as it was in uh, Chile to, uh, when they overthrew Allende in 1973. One reason for that is, you know, Allende never had a majority in the government. He was always a minority government. And the Chavistas, up till 2015, had a control of the National Assembly. And Allende never had control of the military. And uh, the, the Venezuelan military is, uh, was Chavista, maybe it must be. There are some people who leave, who get arrested for treasonous acts or something, but basically it's 100% Chavista. So I guess another thing that Venezuela was known for that was famous was its, its communal movement it was trying to build. The communal um, society, a communal society based on cooperatives. I mean, that never really came out that well, but it became uh, an inspiring example. So it became known for its anti-imperialist positions that Chavez took over and over against the United States. I guess I should mention his famous speech in the um, United Nations, which if you, <laughs> I just watched that about a month ago. <laughs> it, was, I mean, it was introduced by someone said that nobody had ever gone to the United Nations and talked like that before when he said the devil was here. I mean, you can watch it on YouTube when he came and spoke the day after George Bush. Uh, Venezuela was also known under the period of Chavez, with these programs still exist, where the social programs is had, which I'll, you probably are aware of them to some extent, but I'll go over them a little. There are social missions where they basically, well, Venezuela also became famous for this because they took the oil wealth that the country had and instead of it going to the wealthy elite, like it does, say, in our country, or in most countries, or Saudi Arabia or so on, they use the oil wealth to go fund social programs for the poor. And with that, they started all these social missions, uh, which benefited the poor people, um, giving community health care, free community health care, housing, food, and education, uh, they eliminated uh, illiteracy. <clears throat> now, one of the more famous one is Mi Mission Barrio Adentro, which uh, provided free health care to about 90% of the population in Venezuela, something that we don't have here, as you know. A lot of that would help with Cuban doctors, thousands of Cuban doctors there that helped to get that uh, program running. Uh, they had programs to eliminate hunger and illiteracy and homelessness. All these things that we see have been getting worse under the years that uh, Chavista Venezuela is in power. It's been getting worse in this, this country. They have the Mission Robinson, which uh, taught 1.7 million people how to read and write. They're complete six years of elementary school. And they have their Mission Rebus, which uh, provides high school education, where 800,000 people have graduated from high school from this program. 
And both of these programs have benefited 2.5 million Venezuelans, or one in eight adults, which is a huge percentage of population. That's one in eight adults. There's a lot of people that benefit from these educational programs. They also have a Canaima uh, program, which provides computers to students. They've given out five million computers to students in Venezuela. They've opened up 33 public universities that have been built by the end of 2016, which offers free college education to students. They've also set up wireless, what, 1,500 or maybe 2,000 wireless locations around the country where you get free internet. They've also started a subsidized food program called Mercal and also ones called CLAPS that give uh, very cheap food to three million homes every two weeks. They have the Grand Mission Vivienda Venezuela that has built two million homes for Venezuel Venezuelans in the last few years, maybe three or four years. It's two million homes, there's population of Venezuela is like 31 million, so they built Two million homes for Venezuelan people in the last three or four years. That's even with economic crisis they're in. <coughs> and they're planning on building another million homes. They've also had various pension programs for the old people and for housewives. Uh, one effect of this is that they reduced poverty in Venezuela, which was at 71% in 1996 to 21% in 2010. Though well, now poverty level has gone up a lot because of the economic sanctions and the economic war going on. And this extreme poverty had dropped from 17% to 5% in 2015. So basically they had cut poverty by two thirds while in the U.S. poverty has been increasing. They've also passed laws defending LGBT rights, transgender rights, indigenous and Afro-descendant rights. And women have played a greater role in the Venezuelan society. So now 48% of the positions in the Venezuelan state are occupied by women. Probably the most famous one is Delcy Rodriguez, if you ever heard her speak. She led the struggle against the OAS chief Almagro trying to sanction Venezuela and she was, she was pretty tough, pretty, she stood her ground and basically defeated them. 55% um, of the grassroots, mo grassroots movements such as communes and communal councils are led by women. Uh, Venezuela has a maternity law where they have the third longest paid maternity leave in the world after Canada and Norway. Oh, I should say, since we're talking about a lot of U.S. propaganda about Venezuela, I forgot to mention back. A turning point in Venezuelan history was in 1989, which I guess maybe some of you know, but that was but when there was a big, uh, that was the year there was this big crackdown on social movements in China, remember? Everybody knows about Tiananmen Square and the people who got killed, which was, I don't know what it was, like 300? But in the same year in Venezuela, they had the same crackdown where the, the army just opened fire on the people after they led a revolt against the neoliberal measures which doubled the prices overnight. And the military killed over 3,000 people. But all that was in February. Tiananmen Square was, as I remember, was like March, April, May, June, 4th. Everybody knew about Tiananmen Square, but you know, the real slaughter that year went on in Venezuela and that was not covered in the U.S. news, which is kind of how the U.S. has been dealing with Venezuela now and even back then. It's just 
Another important thing that Venezuela did uh, under Chavez period was they, he helped organize to ditch the, these Washington backed institutions such as the Organization of American States, the World Trade Organization, and uh, the IMF. Um, he helped, uh, Chavez helped set up the UNISUR, which was the Union of South African Nations, which is a trading bloc between South Africa, uh, South American nations, um, independent of U.S. control. He helped organize a, a bloc of the like more progressive um, or left-wing governments and social movements in Latin America called ALBA, which is uh, made up of the countries of um, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Cuba, Ecuador, Bolivia are the biggest ones. But it also includes a lot of social movements, progressive uh, social movements. So it's like an international organization of progressive forces in Latin America. Uh, the, the Chavez also fought to establish CELAC, which is the community of Latin American and Caribbean states, which was to uh, sideline the OAS by it included all the Latin American states except for Canada and the um, United States. Another important thing that Chavez did was create Telesur, which I don't know if any of you watch Telesur. You can watch it on TV in Spanish all the time, or it's the websites. You can get news on Telesur in English also. Uh, and it's, on Facebook every day. Yeah, you can get it on Facebook. It's a very good source of information. Sometimes I find it a little uh, too positive about what's going on in Venezuela, but it's, it's still a very good source of information. Um, Venezuela is also known an example for what, you know, its aid to Palestine is called it led for an international campaign to have no weapons sales or shipments to Israel. And they've sent all sorts of humanitarian shipments to Israel, especially starting after 2008 when Israel was uh, slaughtering the people in Gaza and Obama was kept his mouth shut. And, um, they've also uh, set up special schools in uh, Venezuela for Palestinian orphans. And they've given 1,000 Palestinian scholarships to study in Venezuela. But I'll go back now to the history of what, under, what the U.S. has been doing uh, once Chavez died, which, since you're Venezuelan, I mean, some people think that Chavez was killed, but I can't. I don't have any evidence either way to say, so I won't. He died on March 5th, 2013. Um, there was a vote in April for the new president. Uh, Maduro won by 1%. The U.S. was expecting that Maduro wouldn't win, but he did win. So the U.S. immediately said that the, the elections were fraudulent. And the opposition said the elections were fraudulent. And it started a bunch of violent protests in the streets. And 43 people were killed because of these protests. And the U.S. media, it's always, you know, the government killed all 43 of these people. Whether they did or not, I mean, I suppose some, but most of them were killed by opposition protesters, like putting wires across the streets. So if you're riding a motorcycle, which a lot of people in these countries ride motorcycles, you go and they just take your head right off. Um, so in 2013, there was a lot of violent protests against Maduro, but they failed to have the effect that they wanted of um, unseating Maduro. In 2014, the price of oil dropped, which was the key to the Venezuelan economy. That's where they get 95% of their foreign exchange comes from oil. Um, 
So that caused a, a big problem and has been causing a problem for Venezuela since 2014. The U.S. started escalating its economic and media war against Venezuela more and more in 2014 and on. And the U.S. was pretty confident that its strategies would overturn the government. And it seemed pretty likely they were for a while. Um, but I know there's criticism of the Maduro government, but if you look at his history while he's been president, they have pretty effectively outmaneuvered the U.S. the whole time he's been president. They don't really solve their economic problems too well, but politically, they've outmaneuvered the U.S. government pretty well. If I was going to skip ahead when the opposition won the National Assembly elections in 2015, people basically thought, well, this is the end of the Chavistas. That they're, the opposition is now in control of the government and that they're going to impeach Maduro and that's it. But now this is uh, two years after that. The opposition was completely discredited and in total disarray, and they stay in disarray. So, and the U.S. has uh, their their options are more getting more and more militaristic. But Venezuela, the government, has been pretty effective in um, outmaneuvering the U.S. and the opposition. Uh, I think about 2014, I think it was, when Obama started putting sanctions on Venezuela. Is it 2014? Or 15? 15, I guess. Yeah. When it became an extraordinary threat to our national security. <laughs> and it still is today as we speak. In case you didn't know. Because every year they renew it, that Venezuela is an extraordinary threat to our national security. And that's so they put sanctions on Venezuela because of that. I think Obama thought that he could have removed uh, Maduro before he, while he was still president. It gets a little reminiscent about how they thought they were going to remove Castro when every president. Oh my God, this guy. He's going he's gonna to be out in a year or so. The same with Maduro. They can't. Uh, they think they got him, and they they don't. Um, when they won the uh, National Assembly in 2015, they got almost two thirds of the vote, which I think would have given them power to do um, whatever they wanted. The opposition, and then they to get exactly two-thirds, they swore in three delegates who had won by rigging and, and, and vote buying, and so the this Supreme Court said that these people are, you know, you got to run the elections over again. Or no, they didn't say it, not the Supreme Court, then the, the National, the Electoral Council said there had to be a new elections and these people's uh, results for them winning the election was not valid and had to be new elections for these three, but then the opposition went and swore them in as members of the National Assembly anyway. So then the Supreme Court said, well, um, any, any laws or things that the, the National Assembly passes while these people are still sitting, they're not going to be valid because these people are not supposed to be there. Uh, the opposition really didn't do much to solve their problem and so they kind of wasted their time in the National Assembly not really doing anything, nor did they really plan to do anything. And they were just, they used their power in the National Assembly just to try to get rid of Maduro. They didn't do anything to like solve the needs of the Venezuelan people. And as a result, the people who voted for the opposition got to see, well, these people got empowered and they don't do anything for us. So the opposition discredited themselves by that. Then, uh, meanwhile, the economic war continued with hoarding and selling things. People would sell goods to, in uh, Colombia and there was manipulation of the currency, which I could go into, but it's 
rather complicated, some of these economic things. Um, but there's economic sabotage, uh, the opposition group destroyed the power grid for a period of time, different periods of times. So they killed public figures, policemen, firemen. And then this year, or last year, I mean, the U uh, once Trump got in, he started, I think in March 2017, they had the plan with the U.S. government, the opposition, and the head of the OAS, uh, Luis uh, Almagro, the head of the OAS, to create a situation where they'd say there was a humanitarian crisis in Venezuela, and therefore, because there was that, the international community had, had to intervene to save the Venezuelan people who were suffering under this humanitarian crisis. And of course, they did all they could to uh, create a humanitarian crisis by putting sanctions on Venezuela, uh, blockading them from getting food and medicine, um, violence in the streets, um, killing people in the streets. I don't know if you've seen any videos of them where they'd actually, there was like one pretty nasty one where they just stripped this black Chavista guy, poured a gasoline on him, set him on fire wow. in the video of him running down the street mm -hmm. on fire with all these anti-Chavista people there like celebrating. And they did this not once but uh, at least a dozen times. Um, there was all sorts of violence in the streets starting in March through July which was just in conjunction with the OAS having hearings on declaring a humanitarian crisis in Venezuela. As soon as they opened the hearings, these violent protests started in Venezuela, as if, you know, by coincidence. And what the, OAS, the U.S. was trying to do was to get the OAS to pass a resolution saying there is a humanitarian crisis, and then the U.S. could intervene militarily through the OAS. Uh, and last year, about 120 people were killed, most of them by the opposition during these protests that went on all spring, summer. Um, but the U.S., but Delcy Rodriguez was able to block Almagra and the OAS from passing any humanitarian resolution. So they couldn't really do that, as a, as a, a use that as a way to intervene in Venezuela. Then the U.S. tried the, going through the U.N. to do that, but then you, Venezuela went to the U.N. and countered the U.S. in the U.N., so the U.S. couldn't use the U.N. for that either. Then last summer, um, in the spring of last year, the Maduro called for a constituent assembly on a May Day, and the U.S. and the opposition went all out to... Uh, block the vote for a constituent assembly. The opposition even had a vote on July 16th calling on the Venezuelan people to vote no towards a constituent assembly. So they did have a vote on uh, July 16th and they, the opposition said 7 million people voted and 7 million people voted to say no, we don't want a constituent assembly. And as soon as the vote was over, they burned all the ballots. <laughs> so you couldn't see how many people actually voted and in what way they voted. Did they vote yes or no? It's like they burned all the ballots. But it was a legitimate election in the US media saying that the Venezuelan people have rejected the constituent assembly and this constituent assembly was some authoritarian dictatorial move by uh, Maduro and it was rejected by the Venezuelan people in this vote and this is a humanitarian tragedy and we have to do something to save the Venezuelan people. But so then it, they didn't, the opposition didn't <laughs> After that, the opposition had what they called zero hour, and they called for a general strike before the constituent assembly vote was going to take place, which was July 30th, but that 
general strike flopped. And then there was the constituent assembly vote. Um, which was open to anybody who wanted to run, could run. So there was like 5,000 people running for uh, 545 seats. But all the opposition people didn't participate in this because they all, you know, this is dictatorship, so we're not going to participate. So the Chavistas just won the whole constituent assembly. And the constituent assembly became the highest power in the country. So the, by doing what the opposition doing that, they made a major miscalculation because they just gave all the power back to the, to the Chavistas and then the National Assembly became unimportant because the Constituent Assembly could overrule anybody. Um, then right after the Constituent Assembly vote took place, all the violent protests ended which I don't know if you, you saw all the violent protests in Honduras, I guess, this year. This is probably when I was thinking about that, when I wrote some article criticizing Ava Gallinger about what she was saying about it. I said that uh, there was violent social unrest in the country, like we would see like in Honduras, but the government did not put down these violent protests by calling out the military or calling out the police and smashing people's heads and shooting people. What he did, he didn't, he didn't use death squads against his political opponents, Maduro. He didn't jail or torture the opposition. He had called for a constituent assembly and they had got mass support and then all the violence died down. So the Constituent Assembly basically ended all the, the violent social unrest in the country and restored social peace and, and, and put the end to the, you know, the U.S. was trying to create more and more violence to create a civil war situation and then say, well, we have to intervene to save the people. So what the Maduro did with the Constituent Assembly after was com uh, the vote, came it was it basically it was like probably one of the most humanitarian times in I don't I guess suppose you could say in any history that I would know that a government faced with violent social unrest has ended the social rest by calling for a democratic vote. And there was a democratic vote and then after that the unrest ended. They didn't uh, I don't know think of any other time, but can't think of any other country where something like that has happened. But that doesn't stop the U.S. from saying it wasn't a democratic vote. But basically, like the opposition, they say every vote in Venezuela is not democratic. They only had one democratic vote, and that was when the opposition won the National Assembly. Uh, there is some violence that still resurfaces now, such as that bizarre attack by that guy who was in a low-level person in the military who got a helicopter and flew over the Supreme Court building and some other buildings and threw hand grenades at him. But he was not condemned as a terrorist by the U.S. or other U.S.-backed organs. Or, or you think if you, know, if you throw hand grenades at the Supreme Court building, you might be considered a terrorist, but not, not here. Um, <laughs> so then, then, then in the fall there were elections on April 15th for governors and the opposition wouldn't participate in those elections but some opposition people did and the result was that the, the Chavistas basically they swept the elections they won 23 governor positions and they won 18 of them and then in November or December, there were votes for, for, for mayor with 335 mayoralties were open for, up for re-election and the Chavistas won 308 of them. So the opposition, they go from running in elections to saying elections are uh, 
you know, they're fraudulent, and then they don't participate, and then the Chavistas win all the elections. And it, so they get, and then they, uh, sometimes the opposition runs in elections. So it's confusing to their base because they'll tell the people to go vote for the opposition, and then next they'll tell them, no, all these votes are fake, so don't vote. And then they'll say again, now go vote and vote for us. And then they'll say, no, all the elections are fake, don't vote. Just go out in the streets and protest. Um, I guess the most interesting one is now is going to be uh, the, there's going to be presidential elections in May. There was mediation agreements with the government, the Maduro government and the opposition to make an agreement about elections in April. And they had basically reached an agreement that the Maduro would run and the opposition would run for president and the people would vote and that would decide everything. And then, and this was with, uh, sponsored by the president of Dominican Republic and what other presidents? Oh, backed by the, the Pope. And they basically, had, they had reached an agreement and they were going to sign an agreement and it was an hour and a half before they were going to sign the agreement when Tillerson was in Colombia, they got a phone call from some place in Colombia telling them, don't sign the agreement. And so they didn't sign the agreement. So that was the end of this uh, mediation talks. The U.S. intervened to make sure it didn't happen. Then the opposition went and called for a boycott of the elections because they said the elections would be fraudulent, as they always do. And the elections are not legitimate. But then one opposition person called Henry, Henry Falcone decided to run for president. And he was immediately kicked out of the opposition because he said he was going to run. And he also was threatened with being, take, getting sanctions for the U.S. because he was going to run. Uh, it's a little interesting if I read uh, some of the U.S. statements about elections. Before the December 15th elections, the opposition won, the U.S. had said, the question is not whether the election will be free and fair. It's already been established it won't be. What's unclear is whether Maduro will resort to outright fraud or violence to prevent an opposition victory. But that was, the op that was two weeks before the opposition won those elections. So then the U.S. like, these are free and fair elections. <laughs> Now, in two, last spring, the U.S. was calling for elections all the time in, in Venezuela, presidential elections, saying President Maduro should hold elections as soon as possible. This statement from the U.S. government, March 29th last year. March 30th, they said, we call for the government of Venezuela to hold elections as soon as possible. April 10th, we echo the Venezuelan people's calls for prompt elections. <laughs> April 18th, we call it the government of Venezuela to hold prompt elections. And on May 2nd, they say it's the Venezuelan people who should decide Venezuela's future, which is why we once again call on Venezuelan authorities to promptly hold free, fair, and transparent elections. On May 30th, when people are asking for today, which is for national presidential elections to restore legitimacy to whoever might rule Venezuela moving forward. And it goes on and on from May through June. And now that they are having presidential elections, the U.S. says, no, we don't want president presidential elections in, in, in um, Venezuela. This is a dictatorial move by the government. The U.S. is doing that because they know the opposition is not going to win. That's the only reason. Well, they might win, but I don't... Uh, the U.S. doesn't think the opposition is going to win, and so they're trying to discredit these May elections even before they take place. And so is the opposition, saying that the elections are fraudulent and they can't trust the government. So then the government, the Venezuelan government is going to the U.N. to ask for U.N. observers to watch the elections in May 
and the US government and the opposition is trying to stop the UN from doing it because you know the UN is going to say that these elections are fair and the US knows that. Um, I guess I, I so. I'll go a little bit on the economy. Um, like I said before, I'll bust, um, 95 of the foreign percent of the foreign exchange of Venezuela gets generates comes from oil, and 98 percent of foreign exchange comes from the state sector. But nevertheless, the government has been giving billions of dollars to private business to import food and other materials. For many years, they've been doing this. And for many years, these uh, private businesses have uh, just been, uh, US, the Venezuelan government gives uh, foreign private companies in Venezuela discounted uh, U.S. dollars to uh, import food or spare parts or whatever they want to import. So they, uh, if I go back to maybe four years ago or three years ago, it might be the Bolivar was like 300 to a dollar, but these companies would get, uh, for 10 Bolivars they get a dollar. So they got a very good deal, but they would they did not use this money to import uh, uh, food and other things. They either just took the money and resold the dollars in the black market, making a killing, because they yeah, I pay 10 bolivars, I get a dollar. So I go in the black market and I sell it and I get 300 bolivars. That's a better deal than importing something and getting a little profit. Or they would import stuff and then sell it to uh, Colombia. And this went on for years and years. I'm not, I can't really explain why the Venezuelan government continued to do that. But they did that for many years, which helped ruin their economic system there, created very high inflation. It's so high right now. It's like I went there in 2015 for the December elections, and it was in the black market. One bolivar was eight. One dollar was eight bolivars. But if I use, if I change my dollar into bolivars like that, I mean, I go to McDonald's, I could buy a meal for like a dollar fifteen. So it's like I could go in grocery stores and with. After I change my money in the black market, I could buy stuff I see in the U.S. grocery stores, like uh, 40, 50 percent off of what I see over there, what I'd see here. So, but that, uh, that's when it was 800 bolivars to a dollar. Now it's 235,000 bolivars to a dollar. But as, as I asked people there, I'd say, well, you could still, if you had $50, you could live pretty well here for a month. It's like the same as three years ago. You wouldn't really need, wouldn't suffer for anything. But if you don't have dollars, then you're, you're, then you're really suffering. Uh, in the, see, the, the, the country is still mostly private, Private interests still control most of the country. The 75% of the financial sector is, is in private hands. 92% of manufacturing is in private hands. 70% of the food production and distribution is in private hands. 70% of the media is in private hands. This comes from the BBC. Um, majority of the land remains in pri yeah, private hands. It's still a private uh, economy. They haven't really done anything to end private control of production or distribution of goods. And even though you have cooperatives there, the cooperatives, if they're going to sell their goods, they still go to get controlled by private businessmen. So it's not really like cooperatives are a solution because if they don't control distribution, it's still in the hands of capitalists, 
doesn't really solve that much. Um, people are angry at the government because of the economic situation and they don't really feel that the government's doing enough to solve the problem. And not only that, I don't think the government is doing a good job at explaining to the people what's the cause of the economic problems. I think I'm going to run, like I'll go into some of the sanctions right now that the U.S. is imposing. See, a lot of the sanctions the U.S. is imposing, it looks like it's on individuals, but it's not really. A lot of the individuals are the people who sign contracts. So, if you want to sign any international business contracts with Venezuelans, you can't sign it with them because there are sanctions on these people. Even like uh, Citgo right now cannot send funds to Venezuela. Uh, the country is not able to renegotiate its debt. It cannot um, use dollars in any kind of international transactions. It, it, uh, which I mean, almost all international transactions are in dollars. It's not only the U.S., but it's the European Union and Britain and Canada that have put in sanctions. The country has $2.5 billion stuck in foreign banks that it cannot take out. The country is said to be in default, even though it has paid $73 billion in loans over the last four or five years, and it's not defaulted on any loans. Uh, The U.S. has blocked food shipments to uh, Venezuela because, you know, they order food overseas. A lot of foreign banks won't process the transactions because of the sanctions and they don't want to get in trouble with the U.S. over the international the, the sanctions. And they can't even, uh, when in last fall, when the U Venezuela was going to have a meeting to kind of refinance its, its debt. The, the U.S. government uh, said it was illegal for any U.S. people to meet with them and that it was, was a t possible 10-year prison sentence or a million dollar fine for, for some U.S. person to make any agreements with the Venezuelan government about renegotiating the debt. Uh, the, the U.S. has also blocked things like insulin and malaria and malaria drugs from coming to Venezuela. In fact, the, the U.N. rapporteur for, um, who went to Venezuela last December, Alfred de Zayas, said that Venezuela should take Ven uh, the U.S. to the International Criminal Court for its sanctions because it's, it violates uh, the human rights of the Venezuelan people. And it's basically causing the death of Venezuelan people. People who need malaria or the other kind of drugs, they can't, they can't get it because of the sanctions. The sanctions are getting worse. And they're going to continue to get worse. And with Bolton in the U.S. government now, and I'm sure it's going to get worse. You know, Bolton, the guy, uh, I forget what his position is. Secretary of State. No. Advisor? I knew him when I was doing work around uh, Cuba. He was the one in 2002, before Bush invaded Iraq, he was the one that said that these scientific medical facilities in Cuba were creating biological weapons to be used against us and uh, we need to do we need to do something about it. Bomb them is what he was advocating. That's when Jimmy Carter went to, to Cuba and said no they're actually just making medicine. <laughs> <laughs> Carter's a terrorist. <laughs> Um, since there is some question about, you know, Maduro is not following in the footsteps of Chavez, I will just go into a little 
um, the Chavez was awfully soft on the opposition. Like they did overthrow him in 2002. That's treason, right? A lot of countries you get shot for that. Yeah, you know, Leopoldo Lopez and, and Henry Capriles, Enrique Capriles, who were elected officials later, they were involved in that coup. A lot of these people in the opposition now were involved in that coup. They should have been, he just let them all go, which is kind of crazy. I mean, they make a coup against you, you get rid of the coup, and then you let them go. Like, let's be friends. That They don't work like that. It's like, okay, well, we'll just keep trying again. And that's what they did over and over. Um, he was pretty lenient with going after opposition people, which Maduro is not. He's still, I think, kind of lenient, but he's not as lenient as Chavez. Um, Maduro has been more active in getting commun these people's communes, uh, communal production working. He's created more, helped set up more of uh, these communal um, systems than Chavez did. I guess I won't get time to get into that as much. Um, we Chavez have 45 did, minutes. What? 45 minutes. That's we have 45 it. minutes. And when did I start? Well, you've been talking uh, 51 minutes now. Oh. Okay. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Chavez did very little to diversify the economy. I can't really blame him, but, you know, Maduro inherited that, that the whole economy was based on oil, and the price of oil collapsed under Maduro. Um, okay, I can't go into the economy, it's too well. Um, But I would, okay, to, to end up then, I'll just say that the, the rich elite still have decisive economic control in Venezuela, and that's a problem. They don't have political power, but they have decisive economic control. Now, Washington is continuing going to escalate its war in Venezuela. It is dead set against making, against letting Maduro win the election in May. I don't know what it's going to do, but it's not going to just do nothing. It's going to escalate the situation. I don't know if they're going to militarily intervene or what, but they're just not going to let Maduro get elected president for another six years. Um, maybe they'll embargo Venezuelan oil, which provides one quarter of U.S. oil. Um, there would be a threat to national security. They have to bond themselves. <laughs> well, one key thing that they have to do, and they, they have been doing for several years, is to completely misrepresent the situation in Venezuela so people think it's not worth defending that government or that country because they're so screwed up. It's like, you know, it's their fault they're in that mess. So we don't, we shouldn't bother defending them. It's sort of what they do with Russia, it's what they do with Syria. It's like they make them like, you're totally out of bounds if you want to say anything good about these people. So don't even try to defend them. Uh, now finally, I'd want to say that if you want to get more information, we have this AFGJ Venezuela Weekly that I have been doing for the last two and a half, three years. You can sign up on the Alliance for Global Justice website. Uh, that has news of what's going on in Venezuela and the U.S. campaign against Venezuela. And we'll have Dan Kovalik coming next week, speak Monday night at the Workers United Hall, comparing Venezuela and Colombia. And also he'd written a book called The, um, the Plot to Scapegoat Russia, which he'll be talking about a little. And we'll be having, a, we have monthly Venezuela webinars, the Alliance for Global Justice, and next week will be about the big international solidarity conference that just took place in Venezuela on March 5th. But all those will be on the, you could sign up on the Alliance for Global Justice website, you can get that information. 
Okay. All right. Um, we tonight, thank you very much. We have about uh, 40 odd minutes for Q&A, so I'm just going to kick it off for a second. And, you know, you can come on up here and uh, ask a question of Stan and or, you know, blow your horn about something, whatever you want to say, that's fine. Um, you know, listening to this, uh, the, the interesting thing about it is for me, I mean, you just at the conclusion here, you brought it up with, you know, Russia, 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 Russia. How, you know, they're trying to undermine our wonderful, popular democracy. I mean, this is, this is your example. I mean, what we're doing throughout the rest of the world, you know, if you're on the wrong side of the fence, uh, we're out to get you. You know, that's just basically the way things operate here. And uh, because popular democracy doesn't exist in the United States, I mean, it's a farce. You know, ask yourself the question, why do I vote? These politicians tell us what we want to hear, right? In the run-up to every election. And then, seemingly, once it's been decided, we revert to form, you know? And that's off. Obama's words about national health insurance, that's off the table now. Those were his exact words. Anyway, um, I just thought I would put that out there. So I'm, I'm going to get off here, and so come on up. Lower that microphone two inches. All right. Well, let them do. No, 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 please. please. So, you can lower it. We can lower it. So uh, BBC covers Venezuelan issues generally uh, undermining and demeaning whatever is taking place in the way of uh, addressing the inflation. They uh, mentioned that uh, two zeros were knocked off of the currency, and it was dismissed as irrelevance uh, because it wouldn't address uh, the food crisis uh, there. Can you address, uh, from your uh, experience or your contacts, uh, just what is going on with availability for food, uh, for imported goods, and can you live without imported goods in Venezuela? Go ahead, answer, you can respond to the question. Uh, the, the problem is not food availability, but the price of it. There's a lot of food. Well, there's only selected items that are not available, like some kind of soap, toilet paper, flour, but things that don't make a lot of sugar, but you could get powdered sugar or sugar candy is all you know available, but like sugar wouldn't be. And a lot of this availability is like, well, there has to be like deliberate, these companies deliberately withholding them from the market. And sometimes they do bust some of these companies from warehouses full of food or um, ships full of meat that they just let rot. So there is a lot of food. The problem is that the price of a lot of people, if you don't have any access to the US dollars or you don't get the, the, these kind of claps, these, these uh, I forget what it stands for, but it's hand, uh, basically handouts of food for poor families, three million poor families, and you don't live in the countryside where you grow your own food, then you've got a big problem. I know a friend of mine in Venice, in Caracas, she's they starting to grow their own food and they have to use things like banana peels instead of like taco shell covers, you gotta use banana peels. I don't know what they call them. empanadas instead of empanadas. So yeah, there's a people are losing weight, yes. It's pretty rough. And it's getting more rough. Yeah, I, I just want to jump back in here for a second. You know, you just brought this and you were talking about this earlier with regards to the economics and the sanctions. Now, obviously, I mean, I don't know what percentage of it is of the population, but I would assume, because I've been to Latin America, I've never been to Venezuela, but I've been to Colombia, Ecuador, etc. Um, maybe 10% of the population is living pretty large. Um, is, that, is that basically true? Uh, it's small. I mean, it's smaller than what we would consider our middle class here. So they are the ones that have access to US currency, right? I mean, so this is really what the problem is with regards to the embargoes. And they still have a market economy. It is capitalism. And when your currency's been debased, which again was led by 
we know who. Um, you know, it's like people run around pretty soon. It's Germany all over again in the 19, late 20s. Right? We got wheelbarrows of, you know, Deutschmarks here to buy a loaf of bread or something. But, so, what I'm getting at is, is what, how large is that element in the population that is okay, you know, in relationship to the element that's really struggling? The working class, the peasantry, et cetera. How, did you put a number, could you put a number on that for us, maybe? Um, you know? What percent of the population is well off? I mean, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but I believe maybe 20 or 30 percent live in uh, good condition. I mean, uh, to put that in the American context, uh, in Venezuela there is a uh, racial and economical struggle. So people who live in some places of the country who are white, they can get uh, dollars. So they live in a better condition. They can go to some places where they can get everything. But for that, you need to have uh, uh, dollars or some kind of uh, foreign money. Yeah, so I guess it's Standard thing, well, you count number of white people there and you know. Yeah, for instance, the uh, Enrique the class. Capriles Randowski, his family is from Poland. He's part of the elite. So you can have a general idea that uh, uh, there is some r racial and economical struggle as well in Venezuela. Can you say something about the racial economic uh, divide that uh, splits the class? There's also the class base. Well, I, <laughs> I could just go what I said before. is that 70% of the population was in poverty in 1998. Mm -hmm. That means there must be 30% who were basically middle class, mm -hmm. had access to the oil wealth. And I suppose it's about that now. Maybe it's not 30%, maybe it's 20 I'm not sure. But I could say, like this friend that I know, uh, she said uh, she said she was like middle class for most of the Chavez years. Mm -hmm. But she says now she's poorer than she was in 1998. And if she gets her income and she translates it into dollars, she gets $2 a month. Hmm? Well, she also says, well, she, I mean, they do get subsidized things, subsidized food, but... She has a job and she gets two dollars a month? As she's retired. If it's converted to dollars. Yeah. Like a pension. Yeah, it's... If she uses it, hey? if she uses it. Yeah. Um, Black market, right? It is. So, I mean, a lot of... I mean, it's interesting that these are the people who are suffering the most are the ones who are voting for Maduro, still. And the U.S. is trying to get these people to stop, make them suffer so much that they're not going to vote for Maduro. Mm -hmm. And it's been you know, five years now and the U.S. hasn't been able to do it. And now they figure Maduro's going to win the election again. And I guess the people know what these other people get in power from. <laughs> A lot of us are going to be dead. Uh, may I presume that there's uh, substantial trade between Cuba and uh, Venezuela? And what currency do they use? I, I, I think most of it is like, basically it's doctors for oil. Like barter. <coughs> it's a barter. Yeah. Services. Much Barters of the uh, European uh, market in um, medicines uh, relies on Cuba for its uh, its supply because there's a great deal of uh, innovation and uh, production of medicines in Cuba. Yes. Yeah, I know, but I don't. I know that's like their second or third most important uh, source of foreign exchange. Number one being tourism. I think now it's more than uh, 
it's up there with like tobacco and uh, sugar. You're talking about Cuba now? Yeah. Is tourism still number one? Okay. That's their biggest source of foreign exchange, yeah. In they get a lot of tourists. It keeps growing all the time, more and more tourists. In the cold Cuba. winter months, uh, many, many Europeans uh, take their vacation, their one month vacation in Cuba. Yeah. But I don't know why. The, what uh, I can't really talk about, if you're going to ask me, is that the petrol, petrol, their new currency that Venezuela is using. If you're going to ask me to explain it, I can't. But it's like Bitcoin. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. If that explains it to me, it, yeah, okay. I can't explain that either. But it's based on oil, I guess. And they're going to base it. Also, they have like. Uh, I don't know how many billions of dollars of gold they say they have. So Venezuela has in their minds. Um, but this currency is not based on some, it's based on oil. So you're buying it backed by oil. And they say, you know, so far this year they're building 235,000 homes for poor people based on this petrol. So it actually is some kind of They've already got $5 billion from this uh, currency they're using, but don't ask me to explain. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ana Gil Garcia, and I'm a Venezuelan. Um, I don't know where to start, really, because I've been listening very carefully about what you said. And you mentioned that you've been in Venezuela several times. I have my family there. And I have my family there in which just yesterday I sent $20 uh, because with $20, uh, when they change, exchange that in the black market, they're going to get 4 million bolivares. But with 4 million bolivares, with $20, they will not be able to buy a kilo of fish in Margarita Island where they live. Okay. Um, I go regularly to the country, um, but you know the Venezuela that you picture here today is not the one that I that I learned, that I lived in, that I know, actually. Um, you know, there are some things that you said that probably you're right, but I think it ha if there is another side of the picture as well. And when you talk about middle class, there is no middle class in Venezuela. I mean, Middle class right now doesn't exist because everybody seems to be poor. You know, people that used to buy things with um, twenty dollars now they can buy these things. So, what middle class are we talking about? There is no middle class. Then you talk about um, you mention that you know in the sixteen July sixteen the the votes or whatever paper that was used because it was really a referendum in July 16, you know, 2016, 2017. There, there was no really an, a, a, a vote. Um, and you see that they were burned. But believe me, I work in that the, the whole day. And I have all the votes with me if you want, if you want to see it. And, and, we, and when we voted, the only thing that we did was, you know, we, we counted them and we marked and we put, you know, all the numbers there and the numbers were transmitted, and there was the numbers that uh, the opposition referred to. You know, there was, you said seven million people voted. I believe that you're wrong in that, because there was, you know, closer to 10 million people voted. But that's not the point here. I mean, the point here is that um, United States, of course they're talking about sanctions, but United States has been the first buyer of oil in Venezuela, and it still is. And I like to know really if there is a sanction there. Because for me, a sanction is, I'm not gonna sell you any more, any oil. <coughs> why they don't do that? Why United States is still selling, and why is that Venezuela is still, is, is, is uh, uh, I'm sorry, why Venezuela is still you know, selling, and why United States is still buying? Sanctions means I will not buy anything from you and you people are going to die. Because in Venezuela, there is nothing, nothing that people can grow anywhere because 
non, non this government that is being, this regime has been in government for 20 years. I mean, this is not two years, it's 20 years. But the 40 years before, our economy was based only in oil. And we didn't learn anything about agriculture. We didn't learn anything about raising cows, nothing. Okay, so this is not a new factor. But we were hoping, because I do remember my mother voting for Chavez, and I do remember people in my town voting for Chavez. And those are the Chavistas that today, they say, what happened? Why is that that I can't eat? Why is that that I can't do anything? Where, where, where are the medicines? And every day, we have all this long list of, of medicines in the internet, people looking for medicines, something that simple like, Aspirin, insulin, insulin, and I think, and, and, and then I'm listening here and I said, where should I start? I'm looking for, because I took all these notes, and with all my respect, really, it's about human beings. It's about a child that is dying for malnutrition. It's about that three days ago, we sent to Maracaibo, which is the oil empire in the country, because the lake is right there, and there are 600 children dying for malnutrition in one, only in one organization. And I think about where the money went, where the money is. That's my question. Do you know if I can put this in all zeros and zeros and zeros and put all these millions and billions and millions of dollars that the government received during Chavez government and partially during this the Maduro government, I don't think that people really can imagine how much money that was coming from the oil price. The opposition has not been in power. The opposition has 20 years without being in power. But the government is still claiming that it's because the opposition is because people are dying. But when you have all power concentrated in only one man, because the National Electoral Council, which by the way, they, their, their time expired two years ago, but they are still ruling. And four of the members belong to the government, and only one member to the opposition. What is the balance there? What are the check and balance in the uh, Supreme Court? When the 32 members of the Supreme Court, all of them belong to the government. What are the check and balances there? Do you think here in the United States we would accept that? Okay, let's give, let's give him a chance to respond. You know, thank you for that. Thank you, because really, it was very illustrative coming here today and listening the other side, because there is another side of the story. And I would love that Open University of the Left will have you know, a more balanced presentation. And I would like you to invite us. The ones, you know how many Venezuelans are here right now in Chicago? They are, they are only in Chicago, more than 4,000. And they, they didn't used to come to Chicago because right now, only in the United States, there are four million immigrants from Venezuela. And we don't even know, I, I live in Chicago, and we don't even know what to do with this many because those are medical doctors, those are you know, physicians, those are engineers, those are lawyers that they left the country. Go ahead. Well, I don't think I said that the government is solving the economic problems of the country. I, unless I misspoke, I didn't, I said they were not handling it very well. And the poverty, when I talked about poverty, I said that was up 2015 and now it's poverty rates are going up a lot. 
My friend, I said, living on $2 a month, and you tra translate that in the black market price, that people are suffering a lot. That's true, they are. It's mostly Chavista people. I could say about corruption, there was a lot of government corruption, and I think there was more under Chavez than now, that Maduro is cracking down now more on it, but there's still a lot. But I, someone asked Mark Weisbrot about, you know, him from the Center for Economic Policy Research about corruption in Venezuela. He said, well, it's basically not any better or not any worse than any other Latin American country. It's just kind of standard. There's a lot of corruption there, yeah? But there's always been like that. And I think I said the one thing that the government didn't do and it doesn't do when I was there in 2015. It, it doesn't explain to the people the causes of the economic problems very well. It doesn't do it. It's quite incompetent at that. People blame the government for the problems when it's not really... They're partly responsible, but it's the U.S. that... If the U.S. left the country alone, uh, they wouldn't be having these kind of problems. But, I mean, they'd have the problems of dealing with the lower price of oil, but they wouldn't be in the situation they're in now. So, I don't know if that answers your question well enough. That I said politically they're pretty good at dealing with the U.S., but economically I don't think they're doing a very good job. And when they been giving billions of dollars to private businesses at discounted prices for the money and these companies do not use that money to import food and medicine and all these other things for the Venezuelan people but just go resell it on the black market at higher prices that people cannot afford or they export it to Colombia and get higher prices. And the government doesn't, for years, didn't do anything about it. That's, uh, I mean, the government's people, that's why people voted for the NAFTA opposition in 2015, because they were angry at the government for not doing anything about the problems. But then the opposition got in power, and they really did even less. So, the average person, I can't say, has got a lot of, they don't have a lot to look forward to in their future like the United States. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well there we are. We opposed and then we left, I guess. Um, I just a, a point, I, I looked in my handy dandy telephone, which is of course never wrong, and John Bolton is National Security Advisor this week anyway. And he was uh, the UN delegate uh, before from the United States. Um, my question is, and, and you may have said this before, and I apologize if we missed it because we were late, is what, uh, about what percent of the uh, Venezuelan population do, is considered the opposition and what percent are considered chavistas? Well, I suppose you could say the hardcore chavistas, maybe 20, 25 percent, and then there's People that go back and forth. I think the highest vote that the opposition got in an election was like 54%. And I, but I think the last elections where they ran against the government, the government, the PSUV, the Socialist Party of Venezuela, the Maduro Party, I think they got like 55%. So there's a middle. So 40% are opposition? Would you uh, guess so? Under Chavez, it was like 40%. Now, he never got 60%. Maybe he once got 58%. 40-some percent, yeah. Yeah, I must say, I was just reading an article the other day, that a lot of these governments, like Ecuador and Bolivia and, and Venezuela, they did a lot to improve the standard of living of poor people, but they really didn't politically educate them about 
why they were doing this and how they were doing this. They kind of upgraded people to middle class standards and then they got to think like middle class people and then they voted for the middle class, you know, opposition candidate kind of people. Because they didn't politically educate people. Oh, and I also could say, like 2015, I was also in Cuba for two months. Now, Cuba, you can have shortages and people do without a lot. And in 2015, there, Cubans were still doing without a lot more than people in Venezuela were. But they could tell you, I don't get coffee because of this. And I don't get meat because of this. And they can explain why they had shortages and what the cause of it was and what needs to be done to end the shortages. The average Cuban could do that. They were told and explained by the government why. The Venezuelan government didn't do that with the people, which is a major, it's a big mistake because if you're being told that you have to do without, and you're told why, and you understand it, and you, you know, you think, well, okay, we'll work on it, and we'll solve the problem later, and I'll just do without while for a period of time, the people go along with that. But if people are just doing without, and they don't know why, and see other people get stuff, and they don't, then they get angry, and they're going to blame somebody. Yes, a quick. Coming. When I say that, that there is a kind of economical and uh, racial struggle, I mean by that that if not, when I say white or brown people, it doesn't mean totally white. It means a concept that it means power, money, etc. So when I say that, I put in the American context so you can understand there is a kind of pyramid on the top is the white and powerful and at the bottom is uh, black uh, and poor people so in Venezuela there is a mix between class and race so uh, a few moments ago you can show that uh, that part of the economical and racial struggle. So that woman who talked to us, that woman is an activist. Uh, she is linked to the most powerful right wing in the country. Uh, she, the one here? Huh? The one who just spoke here. Yeah. The woman who just yes. spoke uh, here. Yes. Uh, Ana Hill Garcia. She's linked to the most powerful right wing in the country. Uh, you can uh, find on her Facebook account, for instance, that uh, she met uh, uh, one of our former ambassador to United Nations uh, area. I don't remember. Uh, his complete name. Uh, she's linked to the, uh, when I said far, far right wing, it means fascists. But when I say that, uh, we, we have to put in the Latin American context. It's not the same like uh, in the US or maybe in Spain or Italy. I understand that because my family is from Italy. And I, I mean, I understand that whole uh, historical context. Uh, usually, they try to point out uh, things, but they don't explain the context. It's true that there is an economical problem, but you, you have to put that in the context that uh, there is some political struggle for the power. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much.
very much. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about this food business. Uh, it, as I remember, but I don't know the details, uh, Cuba had a big problem with Q2, and they have one of the best uh, urban uh, uh, gardens and all that for growing food, plus a lot of organic agriculture and all that. Is uh, Venezuela doing anything, land reform, or cooperatives, or anything about growing food? Uh, Venezuela does some. But even Cuba, they still not, they still have to import a lot of food. Even after almost 30 years, 25 years of trying to grow their own food, they're still not uh, self-sufficient in food. They still have to import, that's I think their biggest foreign exchange item, their biggest expense is food. Like rice and, and chicken and even though they got a lot of farmland that is not being farmed and a lot of Cubans who are not really working and they don't still grow food. It makes themselves self-sufficient. Um, I'm not, uh, it's hard to explain what's the problem. Maybe people don't want to go back to the countryside. Maybe it's not a dictatorship. <laughs> <laughs> but I know like uh, Bolivia went from being importing 80% of its food to being 95% food self-sufficient in 10 years under Evo Morales. Uh, Venezuela is not doing very well either. They do grow a lot of food, but the problem is I can grow cat meat or cattle and, you know, made for meat in, uh, in Venezuela, but then a lot of people, they go sell it in Colombia because they get higher prices in Colombia for their meat than they do in Venezuela. So it's not just growing food. <laughs> they have the still, you know, the private distribution that private companies own the uh, distribution system. Like I remember I went to a coffee cooperative and it was a very good cooperative and everything and they, they used their profits and went to the community and all that. But when I asked them, well, when you sell your product, you know, who controls it? And he says, well, there's three private families that control the whole coffee distribution system in the country. So then what difference does it make if there's a lot of cooperatives? If these people still control the distribution, then what difference does it make if it's privately produced uh, or cooperatively produced stuff? They still control it. That's... monopoly control by Yeah, so it's... Uh, and Venezuela, it's still a privately controlled uh, distribution system. I mean, they have some public distribution, but not a lot. Okay, this is going to be the last question slash comment, whatever, because we are running up against uh, an hour and a half. And the reason why we do this, by the way, is just so, you know, nobody thinks there's something devious going on. That's okay. uh, what we're trying to do is, like, if you wanted to burn that, by the way, you'll be able to view this program. There's your shortcut link, open you never the left, dash YouTube. It should be up there by midnight tonight uh, with all the warts and all. Uh, I just want to make a couple comments. Um, that, first of all, the woman who was over who, who spoke, this is highly unusual that we, although I sort of semi-anticipated something like this, that somebody that represents the, there's two words, I don't speak Spanish, but I know there's, I'm looking around here and I know there's many people who, that's probably their first language, latifundista and comprador. Um, I think what happened, and this is one of the reasons why I was asking these questions about numbers and everything, because I still don't feel like I got an answer here. But that's not a criticism of you. I'm just saying that I think we have a lot of people that have opinions. I have opinions. Um, and we may not be as informed as we should be. But in any event, the point I'm trying to make, and that's why we do things like this, because we're, you know, Open University of the Left is basically an educational project. I mean, what we're doing here is trying to get people to think about things and maybe think outside the box, you know, not necessarily what I think I heard out of her. And, because uh, she was clearly against the government, she's not a socialist, 
and I'm going to use those two words that I used before, in most, much of Latin America, um, you have, essentially, the wealth is tied up in the land. Obviously, uh, Venezuela, we have this, they have, I don't know if it's a blessing or a curse, uh, insofar as they have petroleum, you know? And I guarantee that somebody would be buying that stuff if it wasn't us. It's, it's just the way things are. And I think that as a consequence of, uh, since Chavez and these governments that are somewhat socialist, because you've made this point over and over, and I think it's very accurate and good, that uh, there's a lot of opposition that was allowed to get away with an incredible amount of nonsense that I would find hard to believe that this would happen in other places. I mean, like, people usually wind up in some gulag somewhere, and obviously that didn't happen here. So they allow the people that would destroy them to still operate on the margins, and we have all of this unrest that I would argue has probably been brought about more by our insinuating ourselves. In, I'm talking about the United States government, because my, my position on this is not only to do the United, not only does the United States government not care about me or you or anybody in this room, let alone do they care about people in other countries, particularly poor countries that may be, you know, less well developed than our own. The only thing they care about is that goddamn oil. That's really what we're about. That's why we're there. That's why I want this government removed. It's not like we are somebody that is like genuinely concerned about humanity. You know, we're not. We know that. But in any event, if you want to just wrap it up, that's my two cents worth, and this will be the final comments. Thank you. All right. I don't think the right-wing Venezuelans I sometimes had to argue with. She says a lot more factual information than a lot of them I've heard that just totally make up stuff. Just <laughs> reality is no... Uh, restriction on what they want to say. Um, the, one, the one problem with uh, Venezuela solving its economic problems is that in Cuba they have a, a, a communist party that is rooted in the people and it's in the people. The, the Socialist Party of Venezuela is basically an electoral party. They run electoral campaigns and that's it. They're not really involved in the people. And a lot of them are just kind of careerist people. Some of them, a lot of them are committed, but there's also a lot of just careerists. So it's not really a tool that you can use to like advance the revolution. It's capitalism. No. It's still a capitalist system. No, I mean the, the party there. It's not party. I can't really look at that party as being, you know, mm -hmm. this is gonna lead the struggle forward. It's mm -hmm. not it's kind of a weak tool for that. Um, and that way I guess I come back to I say it's like Venezuela is like the Spanish Republic of today. I mean the Spanish Republic had an awful lot of internal problems that led to its defeat. It wasn't just the fascists. I don't know, maybe they were lost in the end anyways. I mean they was blockaded and they were attacked by the right, the fascists and supported by Hitler and Mussolini. But they also had a lot of uh, internal contradictions that helped uh, lead to their downfall. Venezuela has a lot of internal contradictions in the, in the Chavista movement. You know, there's like refor reformist Chavistas who don't want to be socialists and then they're like real, like we want a socialist revolution Chavistas and they're all you know, there's going to be conflicts. You're always hearing about different Chavista leaders who get, you know, they, they leave the country and then they say, you know, it's a dictatorship and blah, blah, blah. And they, you know, it's like social democratic type people who think, you know, Maduro's going too far. Like they just, they just arrested the, uh, they, they arrested, I think, 70 leaders of PDVSA, the oil company, for corruption. They arrested uh, Rafael Ramirez, I think is his name, who was a UN representative for corruption. Supposed to have like five billion dollars, him and some others, in, a, in foreign bank accounts. Who owns Sitka? Venezuela? The government. It's, it's 
It's a government entity. Uh, yes, yes, so. Yes. Okay. A lot of them were arrested for corruption. Okay. I mean, some of these, you know, they've been involved in corrupt activities for six or eight years, and they were appointed by Chavez. So there's a lot of corruption in the leadership. I mean, I don't think Maduro is corrupt or other, but a lot of other figures are. They're just not revolutionary people. Maybe they're just like, you know, very liberals, like liberals. <laughs> you know, like middle class liberal. <laughs> Corrupt. So, you know, they want to, you know, they got to, they're progressive, but they also want to live well. They're not really not like the, like the Venezuela diplomats that I've met. They're really not like Cuban ones. Cuban ones, like if the government tells them to go, you know, you're going to go over there for five years and you're going to make $10 a month and you're going to be out in the middle of nowhere, to, okay, if you order me to do that, then I do that willingly and gladly to help the revolution, yes. They're political. Not, not like, not Venezuelan diplomats are not like that. <laughs> it's a different type of person, like different class of people come from a different social class, have different consciousness. And I think that's true for a lot of the people in the PSUV. There's just not a lot of political education there. Right. Amen. All right, I guess that's about it. So thank you, Stan, very much.